We have item A1, lease modification number one with Wilwin Properties, LLC. And we have Contracts Administrator Melinda Monroe here to present. Welcome, Ms. Monroe. Okay, this is me. Sorry, thank you. Um, tonight I am presenting the Will Win Lease Renewal. In 2021, the Win Group, um, the business of Will Win Properties, purchased the city with a request to lease the vacant land next to the building at 1921 Union Way. Oh, microphone didn't cut out. It should stay on. Yep. All right. Okay. Uh, all right, uh, try not to break the bag here. So after confirming with water resources and storm water, there is no planned use for this location due to its proximity to the building in 1921 Newton Way, it was approved. Wilman currently has a site improvement plan under review with DCD, which will take into account the terms of this lease if approved. As part of the site improvement, Wilman Properties would like to extend this lease agreement until 2032. Uh, and with that, have the uh, amendment one or modification one to the uh, lease with the properties. Please. All right, thank you. Anybody have questions or comments? Michael. Can you just say again when, when did the first lease come into effect? Um, it came into just give us some quick basics. Yeah. Quick I think basics of. Sure, uh, 2021, and it was a two year lease, um, which we were allowed to uh, approve for them uh, according to our uh, DMC. Um, it includes four parking stalls um, next to their, their current lease site at 1921 in Way. Um, the, uh, the site layout at the time, the proposed site layout at the time is attached to that lease. Um, since that time, they have uh, come in with a uh, site improvement plan and actually um, renovation um, to the building envelope uh, and, and would like to extend their lease in support of that plan. Sarah? Yeah, I was going to ask. It doesn't look like it's currently in use right now, so, but they have plans and so they want to retain um, a lease on that property because that will include, that will be included in their plan. Okay. Do we, do we know when something's going to go in there? No. I do not. Okay. Yeah. No problem. I I, and I did have like a logistical question. You may or may not be able to answer it, but I was just interested because I saw that there's um, a line in there about the Seattle area CPI. You, so like, do we normally use... Um, Sorry, can I ask the side chat? To... Do we normally use the uh, Seattle Consumer Price Index when, uh, in our um, figures? I guess that's something new that I haven't seen in our, maybe it is in there often. I just haven't seen it before. Um, on page, it's actually just on page one of three of the lease modification. Um, plus a monthly amount of the Seattle area CPIU increase. Yeah. yeah, so we actually, we have it in, uh, like you said, in 4.1 in the monthly payment, and then we include it as an annual adjustment. And it is a pretty standard term that we use for uh, lease increases, just so that you know, we aren't stuck with increased costs or maintenance um, without, without an increase um, for the payment. Okay, thank you, that's all. Any other questions, Denise? Then Montana. Council member Good now pointed out to me that I should be paying better attention because this is in my district. <laughs> um, that aside, our was all about. Uh, I just wanted to confirm it. It appears that this is property that's being used by developers. They're redeveloping a piece of property building. Is that? Um, yes, they really yeah. are. Yes. So they're using it for their construction workers or, you know, whatever to park and I drive by there every day. Um, that is no? a slightly different um, okay. piece of property. Um, what do they use it for? And I'm sorry. Uh, okay. uh, they are a management agent uh, agency, so they will probably be using it for real estate and, you know, a variety of other related business. Um, but basically office, 
um, in general business um, overall activity. So yeah, um, up to four. There is really only room for four legal parking stalls there. So that would be the most likely to be able to use it for. I'm trying to think where exactly this is. Do you have any? Sure. Um, it's right across. I would say it's um, towards the hair salon. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, right next to the yeah, hair salon and right across the uh, uh, Boulevard uh, entrance there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you, Michael. Anna. Hey, good evening, Melinda. Um, so this is Shoreline property that the city owns. And um, we had a two year lease and now we're looking for a an eight year to extending it for another eight years. Um, what is roughly the nature of, in other words, you're getting a couple of grand a year plus the CPI um, to tie up a piece of shore love, shorefront property until 2032. So they've got to be some pretty darn good improvements. What are they? Um, so I'm not familiar with all the improvements in your site plan. Um, I do know that it includes the building envelope and uh, they would want to pave the, the site. Um, and I think they're also going to be, you know, making it legal parking stalls. I don't know if that, you know, it's probably going to need to include that ADA stuff. Um, okay. Yes. With these mics, they're kind of strange. Like once you can hear your own voice coming out of them, then you're, then you're close enough. <laughs> Um, I took me five tries to learn that. So we have pervious area now, and we're going to change it to impervious area right next to the shore. Maybe that is not necessarily a part of this lease. Um, that will depend on their the approval of their site plan. So that really is enough for me to, to say if we will or will not. So. Okay. Um, would they be willing, do you think, to accept a shorter lease term? Um, they may be willing to do that. Okay, um, since we have a whole variable left out of the equation, which we don't know what are the improvements they're going to be making, like are they going to put in a splash pad for all of the children of East Bremerton? Um, or since we don't know that, um, in my opinion, I, I would like to think about this. Is there some urgency to this particular one? I don't believe that there is. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I think we, we can. Uh, I mean, they have been sort of waiting a while as we've been going through their site improvement. Um, uh, but there isn't obviously any huge urgency for us. Uh, it isn't every day that we get an offer on a piece of property like this. Um, that would be my only concern. Um, but if we do have additional questions, I can certainly bring them back. Okay. And, and I'll bring them back. Thank you. That, that would be my additional question is could they get by with like just another two year lease? Well, I don't think that would be appropriate. I would say that they, with the site plans that they'd like to have passed, um, they wanted at least a five year lease. Um, I mean, they really wanted, you know, a full another 10 years. Um, we said, let's just make it a 10 year even from the start um, and see if that works for you. Um, they agreed to that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where we've been. I think that if they were, um, that would probably change their site plan. So a two year lease okay. probably would not be going to go forward with some of those improvements. Thank so, you. Well, I, I'm just voting on this that I, I'd like to see the improvements before locking into another eight years. That's just me and one of seven. What are Eric, any comments? Second. I'm just to you and I'll cycle back for another quick round. Just following up on that. So if they do do any improvements to the property, does that come back to us for approval before they build and develop? Um, that would uh, depend on uh, DCD. Okay. Um, yeah, so that would not necessarily go through you. And then the old contract ended December 2022, if I got that right. So are they they're currently not using the property at the moment? That's right. And they are in full build over status, which is in their current, which was in their current lease. Okay. And then options, are we, are we able to sell this piece of property to them or anybody else? Is that an option or is it, uh, I'm just weighing in the yeah. context of, yeah. uh, you know, it said it's about 3,000 years of the city, not a whole lot. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we do have a termination clause actually in this lease. Uh, it's just a 90 day no cause termination clause. So if at any point you do have an offer, of course, sales that is more attractive. Um, that's certainly something you can do. And they actually are required to uh, return the lease to prior conditions. So, um, yeah. Uh, Denise the Michael. Um, I'm now that we've mentioned DCD, I'm interested in how this fits into the redevelopment that's going on along Wheaton and then up through District 2. So I'd hate to see people investing uh, in a commercial space. I mean, that's from, you know, waterfront residential space as well. So I'm just wondering when these things come up, I mean, is it DCD that's working with you? They're, they're like, okay, this is cool. This fits into our plan. Uh, and if we ever want to sell this, we can. And I guess, you, do you know what I'm asking? I, I think I do. And I would say that we did not, um, um, we are working with DCD. We did get DCD approval okay. to move forward with the lease. Okay. So, okay. Um, then I'm going to just ask Director Spencer, even though she removed her papers, can you just confirm for me so that I feel com more comfortable that that this is part of uh, or is it is uh, 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 what am I trying to say? It's not in conflict. Thank you uh, with the overall planning and goals for that area. So sorry, Director Spencer, do you mind coming to a mic or bring my deal? Or I, can, I can rephrase, but I'm going to mess it up. <laughs> Andrea Spencer, Director of Community Development. Any challenge, oftentimes the biggest challenge to getting buildings reused is having parking available. And the use, reuse of a building is what the proposal is, is more than likely consistent with the adopted zoning regulation. So having them have parking available in an adjacent place was gonna be the turning point to get a building actually revitalized and into use. So if it doesn't have parking, it's going to be another vacant building that sits there without any use. So I think this would be key to be able to move that forward for, for this revitalization of that building. That is very helpful to me. Thank you, Director. And thank you, Melinda, for being patient with me. Michael? Okay. I, overall, I think it's a good idea. It's, it's been a dirt lot for a long time. We would generate some revenue. They're going to fix it up. Now we're, I've just learned that we're going to be able to uh, reuse that building. Why do we own it in the first place? Do we need access to the shoreline? Is it just a leftover piece? Um, yeah, it, it, it is actually one of those leftover pieces that we, as we, um, we, uh, we became the charter city that we inherited from a variety of other uh, uh, sources, let's put it that way. So, um, they will, yeah. will they have to pay tax, tax on the improvements they make to the land? That is a good question. I think they probably will. They won't as for this lease. Um, this lease only requires useful tax, um, so that but they they may be paying taxes just on their their lease on their building. Um, so we're not requiring anything more than useful tax, um, which is based on our our uh, lease and not at the site. Oh, anyways, it seems to it seems it seems fine. Okay, thank you. So let me take a poll and see how many folks are comfortable with this going to. Let me see if there are people in uh, there. Sorry, are people in favor of consent? Or it sounds like there's still some outstanding questions. If you're in favor of consent, just give me a thumbs up. I don't see one. Okay, so then for general business, is there enough thumbs up to just go to general business next week or? Uh, is there a majority wanting more questions or to go back with a different lease term? Jan, do you have a proposal? I'd just like to get 
just a ballpark idea of, of what revitalizing a building means because I truly don't know. Um, so, and if all of those improvements of revitalizing the building, will those all have to be rolled back at the term at the end of the lease? Um, not the building itself, because that will be a different parcel, okay. but um, potentially the lot, uh, the parking lot that is adjacent. So they might take up all the paving. Um, that more than likely will not be the outcome, but uh, right, we we could we could potentially say yes, thank you, and make your parking lot. <laughs> so, okay. um, Jeff, so may I ask I one follow up? Yeah, one question. I think we got Sorry, council. So. Here. The building belongs to them and that's on their land. The parking lot belongs to us, it's on our land. Yes, all right, finally understanding. Okay, so nothing that they do to the building, it, it'll just revitalize the neighborhood. It won't be a benefit to us. And the parking is what they need to do in order to make that revitalization of the neighborhood possible. Okay, I would just, I'm happy to put this on general business and to let it move forward. Um, and again, I'm just voting. I just would really like to have a little bit of understanding of the revitalization. And otherwise, okay, I'm um, better to have occupation than just emptiness. Excellent comments, good thoughts. All right, so this will go on general business, um, but sorry, Bill. yeah. So I would say that is up to, I think BCD Director Spencer has heard on his comments on um, wanting to understand the greater context of development in the region. And it's up to her if she wants to present it next week at general business or, or not. Yeah. The order for the day or not the use of the building. The right. council does not need any authority over the use of the building. Um, the question of the day is, do you, will you allow this parcel that is adjacent to the right. building to use the parking? Of the day. So there's nothing for me to respond to about the building. No, fair enough. That's which I'm fine with. Oh. So. Okay, so this is going general business for next week. All right. Thank you so much, Ms. Monroe. All right. Next up, we have item A2 entitled Proposed Public Hearing Resolution to Adopt the City Share of the Kitsap County City of Bremerton Home Consortium Home ARP Allocation Plan and CDBG Program Administrator Sir Linus here to present. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for allowing me to present today. Uh, we're going to be looking at the Kitsap County City of Bremerton Home Consortium Home ARP Allocation Plan. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Executive Director Jill Stanton from Bremerton Housing Authority for joining me today. Um, she'll be available also if there are any questions um, specifically for, for BHA. Next slide, please. Just a quick overview of what we're reviewing this evening. Um, first, how much funding is available, the regulations and requirements of this funding, consultations uh, and needs assessment that were done, and what that funding breakdown looks like between city and county and our other um, and our public participation efforts. Next slide. The Kitsap County City of Bremerton Home Consortium has received $2.6 million of Home American Rescue Plan funds from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to address the need for housing and supportive services for families who are homeless, at risk of homelessness, or in other vulnerable populations. Of that $2.6 million, Bremerton's allocation will be $822,538. Next slide. Funding is specifically meant for development and support of affordable rental housing, provision of supportive services, acquisition and development of non-congregate shelters, and tenant-based rental assistance. Additionally, funds must be used to benefit individuals who are homeless, at risk of homelessness, fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, or human trafficking, and other families requiring services or assistance to prevent homelessness or are at greater risk of housing instability due to low income and high housing cost burden, as well as veterans and their families that also meet the above criteria. Next slide. The allocation plan itself is a requirement for the county and city to receive funding 
per HUD regulations, the allocation plan must include consultations with agencies who serve qualifying populations, a public participation process, an assessment of unmet needs and gaps in housing and shelter inventory, homeless assistance and services, and homelessness prevention service delivery system. It must also include a summary of the planned uses of the home art funds for eligible activities based on the unmet need. Next slide. The Suffolk County and the City of Bremerton consulted with the Sub Housing and Homelessness Coalition, Kitsap's Continuum of Care, as well as other housing and service providers that address the needs of qualifying populations and organizations that address fair housing, civil rights, and the needs of people with disabilities. A presentation was made at the May 18th uh, regular meeting of the Kitsap Housing and Homelessness Coalition of uh, uh, 2020, back in 2022, sorry. Staff presented information on the home art funds and feedback was encouraged by uh, from coalition members. There was widespread consensus that the most urgent housing need is for more units of deeply affordable housing and supportive housing units. The most urgent services needed included case management, mental health and behavioral health counseling, transportation services, more housing navigators to help people navigate the housing system, and remain housed as well as financial assistance for housing such as deposits and first month rent. Gaps identified included lack of affordable housing, lack of supportive housing units for those coming out of homelessness or with barriers. Also noted were the limited number of shelter beds, challenging housing referral system, lack of housing services for the most seriously mental ill and those with barriers like poor credit, criminal history and poor rental history. And when asked uh, what the top priority where this limited funding should be, the most common answer was investment in more affordable housing units. Next slide, please. There is a lot of data included in the needs assessment and gap analysis in the allocation plan. It's uh, pages five through 20 of the allocation plan, so a lot of data. And these are just some major takeaways. Kitsap County had a shortage of 5,782 units of rental housing. Uh, affordable to its extremely low income renter households. So those earning less than 30% uh, medium fam family income. About 50% of all Kitsap County renter households were cost burdened, paying more than 30% of their income on housing costs. In 2021, there were 1,778 households meeting the, the, meeting the homeless definitions. And 62% of those households were literally homeless, 38 were at imminent risk of uh, losing housing. Next slide, please. And this is just a quick timeline of our public participation process. The allocation plan was posted to our federal grants webpage uh, and advertised in the Kitsap Sun uh, for a 15 day comment period. We also encourage comments through uh, social media posts and e news flash for folks on the uh, CDBG subscription list. And then we will also be sending out um, another e news flash for the public hearing, for the proposed public hearing next week. Next slide, please. During the comment period, we did receive two public comments collected by Kitsap County. Uh, both comments are included in your packet. They both highlight uh, the need for more affordable and stable living situations for folks who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. Next slide, please. Just kind of shows our funding breakdown. So that total 2.6 million and how it's broken down um, with the proposed projects. So to best address this urgent need for more units with limited funds available, both the city and county are committed to investing funds in the creation of new affordable housing units. In addition to the urgent need for more housing units, conversations with Bremerton Housing Authority point to the need for housing counselors to assist households with the utilization of housing choice vouchers. Currently, the housing voucher system is underutilized in Kitsap County. Many households who qualify for vouchers struggle to complete the necessary steps to secure housing. It has been determined that a housing navigator is needed to assist households with the process. Um, this would better utilize existing housing resources for many vulnerable households, including uh, home or qualifying populations. The housing navigator position would be a 50-50 partnership with Kitsap County. And on the next slide, I, I'll show you what that looks like broken down, um, what the allocation is for Bremerton. Next slide, please. You can see our total 822,538 and how it's broken down uh, for, each, for each project. That total is less uh, a $41,000 um, set aside for the allocation planning with the HUD 
that requirement. Next slide, please. In partnership with Kitsap County and BHK, and in response to the need for services that help get more housing vouchers out into the community, $402,977 would be set aside for a uh, housing navigator position, it's a three year salary and benefits, as well as a $100,000 commitment for additional security deposit assistance. The housing navigator would provide housing search assistance, um, assistance in the implementation of leasing success strategies, provide high quality customer service to applicants for BHA and housing kickback housing programs. And again, this responds to an urgent need in our community and can hopefully get more housing vouchers out into the region. Next slide, please. City's commitment um, for new rental units would support the creation of nine new affordable housing units. The city, uh, continuing its partnership with BHA, will allocate its share of home art funds to an existing rental development project in Bremerton. This project must serve the qualifying populations mentioned earlier and defining the allocation plan and most, most importantly addresses a really urgent need in the community. Um, as far as next steps, the proposed public hearing is scheduled for next Wednesday. And um, this would be for just Bremerton's allocation as uh, Kitsap County Board of Commissioners is taking separate action on Kitsap County's portion of the allocation plan. Wow. All I have. Um, I'm available for questions, and then if there's any questions specifically for BHA. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Lyman. And, and just stand like I'll give you the opportunity. I don't know if you, there's anything you wanted to say up front about it or just wait for questions or comments. Oh. Perfect. And for those folks online, I stand and just thank city staff and it's, it's happy to be here. Perfect. I'll just say thank you to Kitsap County staff for putting the allocation plan together. <laughs> Everybody. Yeah. All right, council questions, comments? You can use the Jennifer. Unless this came through finance committee, but no, it didn't, right? No. Okay, no, then yeah. So <laughs> trying to be no, I'm trying to be proper. All right, then you see Jennifer. Go ahead. Um so I want some clarification uh, on the navigator uh, position because I'm familiar with Kitsap Community Resources Navigation uh, Program and, and I'm used to all housing navigation going through KCR. So is I know you're in a big, wonderful partnership right now and I'm really excited about that. I think you know that, very supportive of it. Um, I also abhor duplication of services. And so um, if, if you could explain to me, is there, going, is there going to be, what's the separation going to be if Kitsap Community Resources still has a navigator uh, uh, position or program, how will that program work with, with this person? Uh, and, Will this person be a BHA employee? Uh, uh, they're supporting also, I saw Housing Kits app. Um, so I, I just like to understand a little bit about how the partnership is gonna work uh, with KCR. Okay, good, that's a great question. So KCR does have a Housing Navigator um, a position. That Housing Navigator doesn't specifically work with voucher holders. So um, that is one of the places where they don't overlap. And just to give you a sense of, of the need here, we have 84 people currently shopping that have a voucher, but they're looking for housing. And these are people that have challenges in a multiple way of finding housing. So the, this position would specifically work with the voucher holders for both housing Kitsap and BHA. In addition, I think the need in Kitsap County for housing navigation services is greater than what KCR can provide. So we would anticipate that they would work very closely together and we're, uh, you know, we're getting calls all the time, all day long. The mayor gets emails which are forwarded to us for these specific services. So we would not limit it um, to just the voucher holders, but 
it, it primarily that it would be a BHA employee and they would be working with adoption holders, but also we want to be a bigger resource to the community. Thank you. Thank you for that. So it, it appears that um, out of Bremerton's block, is it is it going to be, is it just going into a big uh, uh, the pot? And, you know, so are we funding uh, support services and acquisition of, of housing? What What is that 800 exactly go for? Or is it mingled with other, you know? So the total, so the total for Bremerton Let's see. Back up. Um, I don't need this. $822,538. There's a $41,000 that's like a mandatory set aside to be fed for um, ballot application planning. And then what is left is that housing navigators position $402,000. There's a 50 50 split between us and the county. And then what is left would be for creation of new housing units in partnership with DHA for an, an existing project. Okay, that that helps clarify it. And uh, I don't know how I feel about us paying 50% and the county only paying 50%. But, but you know what, it's nice that they're, you know, gonna, gonna play. Um, and it is Bremerton Housing Authority that has a lot more capacity, I believe, than housing kids have. So um, I understand that. Again, the only uh, leftover angst I have is when you've got two agencies that are funneling uh, needs, you know, uh, you know, identification number, uh, 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 you know, just that duplication of services, whatever fraction of it is overlap is waste. And so whatever we can do to set up a system that like denies that at any point <clears throat> would be fabulous. But other than that, I'm 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 very supportive overall. Is it on? Oh, I just had to push the button the right way. Jeez, I'm good at pushing buttons. I mean, um, I have questions. <laughs> So uh, I really appreciated what uh, Councilman Frye had to say about, you know, why are we doing 50-50? Because they're getting um, 1800000 approximately, and we're getting 800000 So um, I'm interested in exploring the idea, I mean, if um, a certain percentage, is this because a certain percentage is going to the rest of, it's going to Port Orchard, Bainbridge Island, and Falls Grove. And so is it based on uh, the caseload or based on the money? Why is the money not proportionate to the services? I'll answer that question because she did a lot of work to thank you to kind of field, field that very question great oh you got a calculation don't you i do <laughs> good so i'm glad i brought it um so we what we look at is where the vouchers are being distributed we also look at how many vouchers are in our county and then we also look at demographics from the most recent waitlist opening of our housing choice voucher program and um you might be interested to know that the Bremerton Housing Authority has approximately 1,900, a little bit over 1,950 vouchers, whereas Housing KSEP has just over 400. So we by far have a much larger voucher program. We also currently administer their vouchers. So the Housing Navigator would work for BHA, but would also be providing services for Housing KSEP vouchers. Um, if you look at how many vouchers were actually leased in uh, 2022, 62% of them were in the city of Bremerton and the other 38% scattered throughout Kitsap County. Um, and then if you look at our, our uh, voucher wait list, 50% came from Bremerton and 50% came from other places in Kitsap County. Now this doesn't count people that came from outside of the county, but if you're just looking at people in the county, it was about a 50-50 split. So um, the, okay. yeah, the county kind of had the same question. Um, and this is, they actually came back with, well, we think 50-50 is a good, is a good allocation to share. And so theoretically speaking, uh, this housing navigator would have 
I have a caseload of 1,778 or about 1,900. Is that technically what the caseload would be for one person? No, we currently have about the, the number of vouchers. It, it would be less because right now we have 84 shoppers. We are of all of our allocation of 1,900. Um, we have about maybe 1,450 that are currently already leased. So the total amount of leasing potential in our county right now is 555. Uh, we would not have enough money to lease all of those in this year or even between this year and next year. But just to give you an idea, any one time we have between 20 and 100 shoppers. Got it. Okay, that makes more sense to me. Um, and so I have a few more questions. I'm going to try to get through them here. Um, on page 44 of this beautiful, I love, I was telling you earlier, I love this document. It's, um, it's got amazing feedback. If you haven't looked through it, it's got amazing statistics. Um, page 44 is all the different agencies. And so is this housing navigator only working with vouchers or will this housing navigator also be able to connect to all of these? I mean, this isn't even a com complete list with the feedback because some people had no response. So that's really my question is, uh, are they going to be navigating multiple housing or just the voucher system? Thank you. So the mayor actually had the same, um, brought up the same concern with me. So it would primarily be for the vouchers, but we will not turn anybody away. So right now when people call, it's, we're providing them with a, a document that's a resource guide, but we're not able to provide them with just that human touch and somebody to talk with. So having this position would allow us to do that. The expectation would be that this, uh, whoever's in this position would be very familiar with all of the resources in the county so that they would be able to direct people appropriately. Thank you very much, Ms. Hanton. And um, Ms. Lyman, are you the one that put this document together? Was it just a collaborative effort? It's, it's beautiful. It's lots of great data. I, I sure did not. Um, <laughs> I, I contributed in, in small ways, but uh, mm -hmm. Cook County staff really took the, took the brunt of, of putting this together mm -hmm. because they will be um, administering this. Thank you so much. So, uh, so just some questions um, regarding, it says, um, in the introduction, we have the, the language of four families, but the, but the funds actually allow for individuals and four families. And so I think my concern, when I look through the pages five to 20 that you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, we have these statistics that show um, of the different uh, segments, you know, fleeing domestic violence or um, uh, the different segments, um, household composition of households served by coordinated entry location or mobile outreach. Um, you know, what you can see is that um, an overwhelming number of individuals who face homelessness are single male and single female. And so that component has really been left out of the decision to create housing. And, and my personal opinion is it's more politically correct to find housing and support family housing than it is individuals that are out there. So I guess um, my hope had been that we get this large amount of money that we could do something for the largest metric of people that are in need, which is the single male and females mm -hmm. rather than the families, which may not sound politically correct, but that's the largest need, right? So the data sure. shows it. For sure. And I think, um, and I'm not sure where, if there's a spot in here that just says families, but I think in the very first page, it does say qualifying individuals or families. Um, in a couple of different places, benefit qualified individuals and families who are homeless at risk of homelessness. Um, so if that was a omission or something, maybe, yeah. I'll share, I'll put it on it too. So the, I feel like you need a mic. Housing voucher program is also for singles. Okay, so of uh, this number of the the people who were of the 1900 or of the 80 whatever still shopping. Actually, let me ask that one. Of the people who are still shopping, how many are single individuals? Percentage roughly. You don't have to give me. Yeah, I don't have the exact this. number, but I will say it's a pretty large percentage that are single households. Um, over 50. Okay, I think that's all my questions for now. Thank you for indulging me on them. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for this. I really appreciate the data um, and the work that's been put into it. it. Answers all the questions I have. Um, one question that I have is 
you know, this is a navigator pilot program is the intent. Um, you know, I'm assuming that Congress isn't going to send us another rescue package um, anytime soon, but is the intent, hopefully, if they're successful with the navigator program to then shift the class permanently to the city's um, general funds? Is, is that kind of the thinking past the three year program? Or is oh, there, and, and, and if fine answer is like, hey, we just want to wait and see what these, these three years do, but I am curious as to, you know, if it is successful, where do you think funding might come from? Well, one thing to keep in mind is that, so we have 555 available, available vouchers. That's very unique for a housing authority. We probably are the only one in the state of Washington that has that many vouchers available. So our hope and our dream would be in three years to be fully utilized and we would need the level of navigation Navigated that we support. need now. Gotcha. Um, but that being said, just to be fully transparent, we want more vouchers here. So we will apply for every voucher that we can. So there is a possibility that at the end of three years, if this is very successful, um, we've had housing navigation services for some of our other voucher programs that have been very successful. Uh, so it might be something that we look for more funding, whether it be through the city or, you know, I also think HUD has an obligation to not just give us vouchers, but to give us the money to actually utilize the vouchers. So. Yeah, I agree with you on that one. Yeah, so. And this, yeah, uh, sorry, real quick, a mayor, did you uh, have a good plan? Yeah, actually, actually. Explanation of going forward, future funding. Yeah, actually, um, Jill just said it perfectly. We'll, we'll have a good business case to present to you. And then we can weigh how we use those dollars for the navigator program versus what it costs you to purchase or construct new housing. Um, and then we'll, we'll present a business case to you. Okay, perfect. Thanks for that. Thank you. Michael? Uh, so, uh, welcome. Thanks. Um, the, um, the navigator may going to be able to, aside from sort of uh, interfacing directly with the voucher recipient, are they going to be able to like contact landlords and try to bring them into the program in some sense? Yes, that's right. that, that I, I think that's, that's, that's yeah. my impression. Yeah. Any others? Let's see. Anna? Thanks. This is a really excellent example of going out and asking people and correlating the data, asking intelligible questions, not too many of them, and correlating the data. And I, I was just really bowled over by that whole thing. Well done, you guys. Um, if it's down to Kitsap County, then please pass it on. Whoever did it, whoever came up with it, that was really, I was so proud. Um, I don't know if this is germane, and if it's not germane, you could give me a hint by saying, hey, that's not germane. Um, <laughs> but um, I noticed that, I see the big hammer. Um, I noticed that 62% of the vouchers um, are going to Bremerton and 38% are going to the county, as you said. But on page 46, um, I note that 69% of the money is going to the county and 31% to us. Is that just one of those discrepancies a person should just live with and keep moving? So it's the money um, that is not just for vouchers, the home art money. It's not, so we're using it because that's an app, a way you can use it, but it's okay. actually for other things. Got it. Thank you. Again, my compliments. Perfect. Um, oh, sure, could be far up. Yeah. No, I just have a wrap up question. So perfect. Okay. Yes. I, I also absolutely love how much feedback you got. I know that there's a lot of no responses from the agency. One concern that I have about public outreach is that you're using forms of public outreach that aren't reaching homeless people. So what is your plan to actually reach homeless people to find out, to gather data from them besides the public hearing and putting things on email or online was there for instance was there even some people have phones with, with internet you know they can go and get wi-fi maybe they see it on social media but i don't know if they're necessarily tuning in to you know the city of bremerton and you know what i mean so can you help that's, me out with that that's certainly a question i can ask them as well um it's a coordinated effort so and they're you know 
in terms of reaching out to the organizations we've been talking about, because those organizations are serving vulnerable populations. Um, and so, sure. and it's the continuum of care. And so the hope, I guess, would be that all of that would come together and, and provide us with some good feedback, but I can certainly contact them as staff and be and, yeah, and absolutely. And these agencies do good work. I think I, what I just want to make sure of is that we're of the mindset that not that that a houseless person can speak for themselves. They just need an opportunity for a voice, right? And so I just want to encourage you to reach out to the county and ask what the plans are to directly contact houseless individuals for surveying in a way that's accessible, more accessible. Um, and then I just was curious about why the plan was to have nine housing units and not to create um, more um, uh, non-congregate shelter units, which would probably be more for individuals. Am I incorrect in that definition? So the, the nine units for going off of all the data and all the consultation that was done, the overwhelming need was for more units of affordable housing. So that's where the student group took that and said, this is, this is what we're going to do with these funds. Are they available to individuals or families? In, individuals and families. Okay, so they would be like an yes. individual could use the voucher, like a single male could use the voucher on one of the nine units that's proposed in this plan. And these units, it would be open. The idea is that it's open to all vulnerable populations. So as long as those vulnerable populations are being served, then we're removing that requirement. Okay, I think, yeah, I was just curious because I don't know what size the units are. Like yeah. if you're talking about a two or three bedroom, obviously they're not going to give that to a single you know, man. And so um, that's kind of where I'm getting at with it, right? Um, because you could say nine units, but that that's not a lot of that's open not. units. And how can we maximize our dollar to get housing for the highest population without housing? And that seems like it would be for non congregate that's just my rash. That's my logic. And maybe, and I'm not, you know, that's just what I'm thinking. No, that's a good thing. Yeah, I wanted to reassure you, Counselor, the uh, Stand By Me program that you invest in every year um, screens uh, down at ground zero, there are screens applicants who might be most ready to take on a responsibility of a housing voucher. And they provide all kinds of counseling services um, to uh, assist if they're if they're at that level. And um, we, we're definitely going to be working with Municipal Community Health Services who administrates that program. And um, and absolutely, you know, there's a lot of folks there. Not enough, but there's a lot of folks who are ready for that step. Um, thanks, Mayor. Let's see, yeah. let's see if we can get wrapping this one up just because we got a busy agenda for tonight. Thank you, Miss Stanton. Maybe we'll talk later. It looks like you still have some more to say. <laughs> I appreciate it. I always you. have more to say. Girl. Okay, well, we'll talk someday. <laughs> Perfect. No, great questions and clarification on a uh, large sum of money here. Um, just, okay. All right. Quick. Director Spencer, I think we just found out where the whole uh, 50 to 60 percent figure came from. If all the, if we're looking at all the vouchers that are available, and 50 to 60 percent of them are in Bremerton, right? Then that's that's I, I believe what was cited in that report, you know. And and again, I think we need to always ask what is the county doing to develop more affordable housing? I don't, I, I welcome it in Bremerton, I really do. Going in my district, but county better step up with this. So that's at least my viewpoint. <laughs> Oh, perfect. I was going to echo echo that as well. I'm, uh, I'm always glad to see Bremerton do its fair mm -hmm. share. I think we do far more know. than our fair share, um, but absolutely, the, the, it's a big county and um, they can do their fair share as well. Uh, so this will go to public hearing next week. Um, my only question is every time a public hearing comes up is if we get feedback from the public, I, I have nothing specific I would change, but if we hear something compelling, I just want to make sure we got the right mechanism, which is to either um, table it or to be able to make an amendment um, and update this plan on the fly. I just want to be clear the process going forward. I think the process would be that we would go back to the back county and then we would just reserve the comments. Okay, so perfect. There could be a separate action on there. On the okay, so the council, the council in that case, if we, if we saw something compelling, would basically vote no to pass at this moment, go back to the county, come back to something. 
so they keep that. Okay. Always like to ask, and the unlikely scenario that it's clear. Director Spencer. Just so that you understand some context, the home funds come to the county as a whole. They administer the program. We get an entitlement, but we don't run the program. So when you saw that number up there for the forty-one thousand dollars, that pays for Kitsap County staff to run the program. So you have to weigh in to say yes this is how we want to spend we want to spend our part of the asset but you don't actually get to decide does that make sense because it's done as a consortium so the county is in the role and the authority to do that so they do look to you to pass motions and resolutions to this is how we want to spend our money but at the end of the day because we're in a consortium it's the county decide okay appreciate that clarification All right, so with that, we'll have the public hearing next week. And thank you both so much for all your work on this. And thank you to everyone in the county who uh, will be listening as well. All right, next up, we have item A3, Professional Services Agreement with Osborne Consulting, Inc. for the design of the Anderson Creek Dam Removals Project. And we have Engineering Project Manager, Gunnar Frederickson, here to present. Okay, take it away. So, uh, what you have before you is approval of a contract for Osborne Consulting Incorporated. Um, they're going to be providing us permitting support and prepare bid ready plan specifications and engineer's estimate for the project, along with uh, construction support for it. Um, a request for a proposal utilizing the MSRC roster was sent out to five consultants. OCI was selected based on their qualifications. Uh, the project consists of the removal of two 1920s vintage old concrete and earthen dam structures formerly used for a surface drinking water supply from the east and west forks of Anderson Creek. And I've got a map up on the screen. And uh, as you can see, the two dams are located right here. This is the West Fork Dam, which is the smaller of the two, and then the East Fork Dam, which is actually fairly substantial size. Both dam structures have not been utilized since the 1960s. Uh, Fish and Wildlife considers them a total fish blockage and uh, would like to have them removed uh, as well as we do because they are somewhat of an attractive nuisance. Um, this work builds on, and you might remember a few years ago, Wazdog replaced all the culverts here at SR16. Um, so we will, uh, with us removing these dams, we will open up an additional 3.2 miles of stream and approximately 42,000 square yards of in-stream spawning and habitat for uh, salmonoid species. Um, we received the Public Works Trust Fund. Uh, we were uh, notified of that in November uh, for $2 million. And that loan interest is 1.39% for 20 years to be paid for from the waterfront. And that, if you have any questions, I'm your answer. Fantastic. We'll go to Public Works Chiana. I am impressed that you found five consultants who had firms that combined all of these skills because it's a lot. Um, really, really small thing on uh, page 72 in the packet. Um, you want to change commiserate to commensurate. Um, just to make sense, um, it's roughly it's saying that um, that the skills needed are need to be proportional to the project. So that would be commensurate. But what you have is commiserate, which is like you know when you it's a small comfort thing, somebody. Um, okay. So really small thing. Um, then on pages sixty-eight and sixty. Honestly, oh, do you have a page number for that? Yeah, it's page seventy-two. Just so you can correct page seventy-two in the packet. One moment. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Steph can write it down and, and correct it if it's a typo. Uh, it's okay, so, um, under the assumptions, uh, it's bullet point number one under assumptions, make page subtask 600.1. I'm sorry, subtask. Subtask 600.1. Okay. 
and the first assumption is that the level of detail described in the app would be commiserate with the complexity of the project. So it needs to be commensurate. Um, can't, I, the girl can't help it. Um, on pages 68 and 69, I had slightly uh, more substantive queries. I, I reviewed the language in the NWP 27, because that's all you're going to need for this, right? That uh, the NWP 27 from the core, you don't need to like get, um, they, they say they don't need to get any more permitting than that. Correct. Yeah. Um, the in, uh, because it's freshwater, we're yeah. hoping that the permitting is going to be much simpler than like we're having issues with Pine Road Basin where we've had permits in for two years now and we still haven't heard anything. Plus, it's 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 actually the whole project is helping fish, so Correct. that can't hurt. Yeah. Um, just wanted to make sure that the, um, at the 60% design level, you'll have uh, planting designs. I'd like council to review those or I myself to review those, whichever is better, because um, general uh, general condition 23 sections D and E fall specifically for native plants. I'd just like to make sure that while they're doing the site visit, that they're not doing anything fancy. They're just picking native plants that are already there. Correct. And we like to do that anyways, just yeah. because they're the ones that survive. But what we'll also be doing with the design and we'll have on the web page and we'll be posting the 30, 60, and 90 percent design so everybody gets a chance to take a look at it and let us know if they have any comments. Who is better than you? Okay. I asked myself this. Thank you. That's even better. Um, will there be any way for a regular person to find out when the 30 and 60 percent designs are posted? Um, if they are following our web page, um, they'll see that on the web page. And so follow in the web page is what I'll do. Yep. Thank you very much. Appreciate. It. Well done to you. Okay. And honor just to check that this so this went through Public Works Committee and got thumbs up or. Um, no. Or the Anderson Creek did, uh, but not the. Did Osborne Consultant presented and I slept through. I think at that point we were. Selecting the consultants, yeah. we hadn't gotten okay. the team selection yet. No, okay. I just wanted to check on that. Jennifer. Um, I just have a really quick question. I'm excited about all the length of water that's going to be opened up for the fishies. Can you tell me again uh, the length? Because I missed it. Uh, you're talking about the culverts already have been removed, Mr. McCree. Up how many miles? Of Once these dams are removed mm -hmm. uh, between the two. Creek to East and West Fork, it's about 3.2 miles. Wow. Okay. And then is this, I mean, salmon spawning or just general? It's going to be for all species. Okay. So we'll see what, what comes up. Thank you. That's all. Questions? The only question was was there other bids on this project or um, was it just straight to Osborne Consulting? Uh, of the five, we actually had three give us proposals. Um, and that was Osborne, Parametrics, and Fantech who did the original 2017 report. Um, but Osborne, uh, out of the three companies, Osborne was the only company that actually had dam removal experience in Washington State. Okay, I noticed that Fantech language. Had yeah, dam sorry. removal experience in Connecticut, and Parametrics had no dam removal experience, although they've got a ton of culture. Okay, that makes sense. I just saw the language about the. Um, yeah, it wasn't the lowest bidder, it was most experienced. Um, so just checking on the low bid. Okay. Basically, the other two bids didn't meet specs by our qualifications. They, There's no issue with lowest yeah. bidder here, right? Yeah. Correct. So it, the, that we are, per the RCW, we cannot select a consultant based on bid. We have to um, select them based on qualifications. Yeah. Um, if we do have problems in negotiations with price, we can then go ahead and move to the second. But we start off with the first thing. We didn't have that sort of problem with negotiating. Okay, excellent. No, thanks for explaining that. Um, council, is consent for this side? I'm good. Hearing no objections. All right, this is going consent for next week. Thank you very much, Mr. Fred. Yeah. Damn good work. All right. I can never, I can never resist a damn pun. All right. Good damn work. Thanks for stopping me there for a moment. All right. Well, mental, mental blockage. All right, next up is item A4, purchase of a John Deere backhoe in Elegant Street Sweeper and a Coral Contour mower 
and we have Internal Services Manager Chris Montner to present. Welcome, Mr. Montner. Good evening. I am here to present the purchase of vehicles and equipment. There are three vehicles to be replaced within the city's fleet that have met replacement criteria and were approved by city council within the budget. These vehicle purchases exceed the $100,000 threshold and that is why I'm here tonight for council approval of these purchases. These three vehicles will be purchased using the vehicle specific source well contract. Here is additional replacement criteria information for each vehicle. Replacement of vehicle 3019 tobacco criteria was met for replacement of age 21 years old for ERR policy required replacement of 15 years and excessive wear, high equipment run hours, and with high cost of repairs and explicitly required replacement as approved within the 2022 budget. Replacement of vehicle 160316 with street sweeper criteria was met for replacement of age seven years old for ERR policy, replacement of seven years in excessive wear, heavy use and run out and high run hours and the high cost of repairs makes this a required replacement as approved within the 2022 budget. Replacement of vehicle 81800, the mower, Criteria was met for replacement of age, 15 years old, per ERR policy replacement of 10 years, and excessive wear, uh, high equipment hours, and the high cost of maintenance and repairs makes this a required replacement as approved within the 2022 budget. The replacement backhoe assigned to the street division will be an equivalent lifetime backhoe model, John Deere 320P, and we'll have a quick coupler for the front loader bucket to allow for other city attachments such as pallet forks, sweeper broom, et cetera, for better job site work efficiency. New safety features of this tackle are improved LED work lights, safety strobe lights, and ergonomic machine controls for both front and back cabs to increase operator ability. This new backhoe meets or exceeds tier four final emission standards. This will be purchased using the source well contract 032-119-JDC and will come from Cafe Machinery of Tacoma, Washington. The replacement street sweeper assigned to the stormwater division will be an equivalent lifetime sweeper model Elgin Cross to an M2 street sweeper. This new high performance model single engine sweeper is a regenerative air unit that provides air blasts to dislodge dirt and debris for improved street cleaning and increased efficiency. It has an 8.0 cubic yard debris hopper with a life liner system for durability and longer life expectancy of the heavily utilized hopper system. New safety features of this sweeper are improved flashing beacons, Google strobe, backup alarm, and convex mirrors. This new single engine sweeper meets all current federal tier five emission standards. This will be purchased using the source well contract number 093021-ELG and will come from, from Owen Equipment, Tacoma, Washington. The replacement mower assigned to the parks department will be an equivalent lifetime current model contour commercial mower. It is, a, it is comparable in size and temp width. This new contour mower will replace the old wing style deck mower and will allow for safer mowing on slopes, hillsides, and uneven surfaces at our city park property. The new style contour deck conforms to ground lawn surfaces and will provide for improved even grass cutting and will be more efficient. This new mower meets all tier four final emission standards. This will be purchased using the source well contract number 05218 and will come from Turf Star Western from Kent, Washington. Purchase costs including tax are $154,107.39 for the new John Deere Backo 320P, $454,351.14 for the Elgin Crosswind M2 Street Sweeper and $104,992 dollars and 41 cents for the Toro Brown Master 4500 mower for a total purchase amount of $713,450.94 for these replacement 
vehicles and equipment. The approved budget amount for purchase was 582253 with the remaining purchase amount to be funded by the ERR Fund 510. There is sufficient funds within the ERR budget to cover the remaining costs. We do expect a surplus sale value of approximately $18,000 for the replaced equipment after the new vehicles are in city service. Due to recent cost inflation issues causing higher than anticipated prices for vehicles and equipment, we have experienced these higher cost purchase proposals. But with best available pricing by the source wealth contract, we would like to get council approval of these purchases and place our orders as soon as possible, possible to avoid any future price increases. I'm available to answer any questions you may have on this item. Thank you, Mr. Montner. Just to check, does this go through any committee for Phoenix? Okay, perfect. It's fine. Finance. Yeah, it came through Finance Committee. Thank you, um, Mr. Montner. Um, and so, just to kind of summarize, first of all, are we recording? Are we okay? I just noticed. I just want to, okay, cool. I want to make sure we're all good to go on that. So, just to kind of summarize what y'all heard is uh, it doesn't really have any fiscal impact to us except um, what, what originally was budgeted. Uh, we're about 100 and some odd short, and all of the rest of the funds. Um, the equipment is going to be covered by the respective budgets, so public works, parks department, um, and uh, the rest is going to come from the ERR fund. And I just was hoping to get some clarification on what the ERR fund is. So maybe Director Riley can help us out. Sure, happy to. So it's a kind of a savings account for each of our, our funds that we put money into each year. Um, based on what we think the replacement factor for our fleet is. So every year, each fund contributes money to replace that, whatever the going rate is. As uh, uh, Chris talked about tonight, uh, each one of these rigs had different life cycles. So if it's a 15 year cycle, we straight, uh, uh, straight line, appreciate that, like over 15 years with a, with a factor for um, CPI. So uh, that fund sits there. So when these vehicles need to be purchased, they're purchased out of that fund. And then the respective funds each year contribute the replacement factor. Um, and you approve your budget. So all of these uh, vehicles we purchased out of that 510 ERR &R fund is adequate funding in that fund per the respective departments. There's not a need to fund uh, additional funds from the respective departments this year. ERR stands for Equipment Rental and Repair? Equipment yeah, Replacement Reserve. Equipment Replacement Reserve. Um, and this did come through finance and we did get the head nod for it. Thank you. Excellent. Any other questions or comments? All right, seeing Brianna, was that a yes or? Yes, go ahead. I know, I, I wish I could just use Shakespeare voice. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Montner, for your presentation. Um, so the contour mower is replacing a contour mower? Um, it's uh, replacing a, a more of a deck mower that would come down with the, the yeah. deck on each side, and this is a contour one, the individual kind of uh, mowing deck that would uh, contour better. So it's an upgrade. Um, it, it is the same cutting width and, and size wise, it is comparable as an equivalent. Um, the, the, the deck mower uh, isn't available in the size that would, would really require for parts. So it, it's a, it's a equivalent in size and in uh, uh, cut width. Okay, I'm just surprised because the idea that Director Elevato would permit anything to be uneven in the parks and thus requiring a contour mower is so foreign to me. <laughs> but okay, so this sounds like a fun thing and I like it that you know the equipment has radios in it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I just like it. All right. Yeah, it's a normal thing. Thank you very much. That was all my questions. All right. Folks, good with consent for this one. All right. Perfect. Thank you for Mr. Monner for coming well equipped for the discussion. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'm going to try for a pun on everyone now. With <laughs> equipment. Okay. All right. Next up, we have item A5. Contract modification agreement number two with Parametrics Inc. for the decommissioned beach sewer in Lynette, OF 4 to EB 2 project. Managing engineer Bill Davis is here to present. Welcome, Mr. Davis. Good evening, members of the City Council. And this was presented to Public Works Committee on the 21st. 
I'm here tonight to talk about uh, contract modification number two with parametrics for the uh, decommissioning of beach sewer and Manette project. So this is a, a loan funded project by Department of Ecology. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a little bit of background for those of you that are familiar with the project. It's located in Manette between the bridge and East 16th Street. We're decommissioning 1,900 feet of beach sewer uh, in that area. There's uh, approximately 13 sanitary sewer lateral connections there that we're going to be able to connect to. So they include condominiums, some apartments, as well as single family residences. So I wanted to give you a detailed breakdown of what we're going to be doing um, for this contract modification and what it adds up to. So there's uh, multiple tasks associated with this design and uh, Starting out with detailed design, we're adding approximately $40,000 to the contract. And the most significant component of this is that we're adding a 90% design phase. In most projects, um, projects are, they have de design phases of 30, 60, 90, and then final design. Uh, because we had recently done a design with parametrics on the Oyster Bay Beach Sewer, which was a much more complex and large project, we thought that we could do um, a shorter design period to get it accomplished, delivered quicker. Um, but because of the complexities of this project, and we added a city pump station, which I'll talk about, uh, we thought it would be a good idea to add the 90% design to the contract. So we have time to, to do the 90% design because of delays from cultural resources. Um, the second item is it's a smaller item, outreach. We added an additional public outreach just because of the cultural resources issues in the event that Parametrics needs to support us with preparing exhibits documentation for um, any additional public outreach that we might do on the project. And here's the, the biggie right here, the environmental permitting. And cultural resources is, is a subset of environmental permitting. It's, um, in order to get federal permits, there's a process that has to be gone through called Section 106, where um, there has to be a, a consultation where a firm, an archaeologist goes out to a site and does some excavation and identifies whether or not there's areas of concern. And in May of 2022, the subconsultant, cultural resources consultants, uh, there were a subconsultant to parametrics, uh, discovered an intact uh, shell midden on one of the properties. And they also identified that some of the work was in an area, uh, KP45, it's, it's we refer to it as the Manette site. And it's, it's listed on the state register. Uh, so it immediately elevated uh, cultural resources concerns on this project. And in June, we had a pre-consultation meeting with the Department of Ecology, which they consulted with the Suquamish tribe, as well as the uh, Department of Archaeological and Historic Preservation. So there were a lot of stakeholders involved. Um, uh, there were subsequent meetings, and there was a work plan that was developed specifically for a phased work plan. So any work that occurred within the Manette site had to be done uh, with Archaeologists, archaeologists monitoring the work. So it's and it's going to continue to be that way when we go into the phase three of the work for the construction. We'll have to be archaeologists out there during the work. So um, none of us have had this level of scrutiny before, as far as archaeological uh, scrutiny on a project. So um, we're, we appreciate the support. We hired another thing happened. Cultural resources consultant quit. The consultant quit. So. Um, parametrics had to hire a new consultant, which took time for them to get up to speed, but they've been very resourceful and helpful for us. So um, one of the side benefits of all this is that there's more, um, I would say there's more collaboration with the Suquamish tribe. They actually recently provided some input on a development project that we did in the area, you know, gave us some insight and helped us put together an inadvertent discovery plan in the event that anything was discovered during the excavation of, a, of the water main connection. Um, and then there's another component of the environmental permitting is that one of the houses in particular was very low, right above the water. It was three stories in the lowest level. We had very, very difficult time coming up with the design for how we were going to install the grinder pump. Um, and initially, we decided we were going to put it on the beach, which triggered um, different permit requirements, which weren't scoped under, para, under parametrics original scope. So it triggered more permitting. Again, it was iterative. We went back and forth, and ultimately, we, we gotten it off the beach. Um, but they were going down that path for a while of developing and putting together permits that were, were based on a permanent impacts to the beach. Uh, 
The next item is services during construction. Uh, because of all the work that was occurring, we, this was services during construction, that particular task doesn't really start to activate until construction is occurring. The parametric supports us during the work. We took money from that task and allocated it to the permit permitting. We just needed to keep moving in the process. Um, that we also did a small portion that was electrical design. Um, and so this money there re replenishes that task. There was project management because of the increased scope as well as the you know adding 12 months to the project, there's going to be more project management, just time and more deliverables. So we added money to that task. Uh, electrical electrical support, we added money for instrumentation and control drawings which show specific connections within the control panel at the request of our wastewater treatment plant staff. And those will be used as waste as uh, record drawings. It will also be impacting the 90% design. And then management reserve, we replenish that. Originally that was $50,000. And what management reserve is for is, is when uh, differing site conditions or new scope is added to the contract. Uh, it, it's just it's at the discretion of the project manager to take that money and allocate it to that new work. There's a negotiation that occurs. The consultant puts together a scope of work and a budget, and there's a negotiation that occurs, and then we allocate that money. So we used that money for um, hiring that new consultant, thirty-eight thousand toward that new consultant, and ten thousand of it towards parametric. So that fifty thousand dollars is allocated. So um, I'm requesting that twenty thousand dollars of that be replenished in the event that we discover future um, differing site conditions, which could very well be likely. So that's it. Um, one more slide. And then the impact on the schedule. Um, originally, we were intending to instruct, construct starting in early 2023, but because of these impacts um, on permitting and cultural resources issues, it's been pushed out 12 months. So it's a, a big impact on the project and the project management. And, how we can deliver this project. Thank you. Excellent. No, thank you, Mr. Davis, for that update. Um, this went through public works, as you mentioned, Anna. The other floor, if you want to uh, brief on it. Thank you. I am so sorry. <laughs> I heard my sob story. <laughs> um, just you guys. Sorry, Public Works went into this to, to be proactive. You, you know, you said there's a beach sewer, beach sewer bed, let's set up grinder pumps and, and have upland sewers, mm -hmm. right? So I'm just making triply sure, Bill, that pushing it out 12 months isn't likely to trigger some incident, which would really be the cherry on top. No, it shouldn't. It's, this is more about access. You know, it's just difficult to access. The only access is by the Bloodshed Restaurant, and that's for the work I. So um, this will, we'll never have to worry about that again when this goes offline. A bird. Okay. Um, thank you very much. And I, again, I'm so sorry that this project is going on and on. Right. Any other comments, questions? I'll just say, being, well, the question being in district, I, from my recollection, you're, basically in regular contact with all the homeowners that are individually affected on this project and they'll get updates on the timeline and, and get to expect any effects when work occurs. Yes, and when we, um, when we award the contract, we'll have another meeting with, with everyone just to let them know what's going on before they start seeing excavators show up. Excellent, no, fantastic. Yeah, good to see the money for the public outreach there. Um, yeah, for folks who don't know, if you walk across the bridge, there's a marker on the other side, which um, no, it's a Native American, you know, settlement that was right in that right in that area. So um, great to hear that the Squamish were involved and stakeholders and can give you input and um, the archaeological oversight of the project. So thank you for managing this. Um, council, everyone good with consent? All right, all thumbs up. Thank you, Mr. Davis. And this will be on consent for next week. All right. Hey, perfect timing. I'm going to go to the next item and take a quick break. Um, so next we have item A6. Uh, ordinance to repeal and replace section 9A.32.140 of the Burlington Municipal Code, currently entitled Quote Cyberstalking. City Attorney Fennell is here to present. Fennell? Fennell. Fennell. I am so sorry. I'll get it right one of these years. That's all right, President Coughlin. <laughs> A 
long story that I won't even get into. <laughs> My brother yeah. pronounces a Coughlin. I pronounce a Coughlin. Yeah, Whoa. we diverged. All right. Anyway, attorney so, general, take a look. All right. So, so this is really a housekeeping um, issue. We have cyber stalking in our our municipal code right now, but the legislature in the um, last year separated out the RCW um, into um, cyber stalking and cyber harassment separately. Um, and then in reviewing that and making sure that we had the correct reference in our code, um, we realized that spoofing had also been added that we had never adopted. We don't have that as like a huge need um, on the spoofing, but we thought we might as well add it. But the cyber stalking and the cyber harassment are issues. Um, and just so you know how this works is when, when we haven't adopted the state code, um, if those crimes happen in our city, they, they don't go unprosecuted. So don't worry. I mean, it doesn't mean people have gone free or they can have an ad relief. They get referred to the county because they have concurrent jurisdiction. And so um, one of these came up, we realized that we had the wrong citation and we're here to correct it. And so um, the amendment would just make it to where our um, code that changes it from cyber stalking because it's now called the Washington Cyber Crime Act. Um, it adopts the definition section from the RCW as spoofing, electronic data tampering, and then the two citations to cyber harassment and cyber stalking. These are all mis gross misdemeanors that are um, things that we can prosecute locally, and so we want them on our code so that we can do so with the contact. Thank you. Any questions, comments on this? Seeing any? I see a brief hesitation. Go for it. Uh, yeah, it came through. Yeah, came through public safety. We gave the hood nod to keep on going. But um, what is spoofing? I'm Googling it right now, but I. You don't have to do Google it. I have it ready for so it's, um Okay, so that is the practice where someone will um, rip your uh, like login information. Ah, so I'll read it. A person is guilty of spoofing if he or she, without authorization, knowingly initiates the transmission, display, or receipt of the identifying information of another organization or person for the purpose of gaining unauthorized access to electronic data, a data system, or data network with the intent to commit another crime in violation of state law not included in the chapter. Speaking of interesting. So when somebody steals a password for like your random account and then they use that information to get larger information, like to get your email, into your email, that sort of thing, that kind of thing. Like, okay. like I said, I don't mean to think one of the types come up, but Michael. So sorry, uh, microphone just ripped from someone I know. And maybe you shouldn't have. Yeah. Have you addressed each other at a Study no, I was gonna. Sorry, I should go, but I should be Alex. Thank you. Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we can. We don't use there the are microphones in study sessions. <laughs> I like that. Uh, oh, we want to do it. Somebody spoofed themselves to pretend to be somebody else. Okay. So, yeah, like, I think it's it's just being dishonest with your computer. <laughs> There's a little bit less <laughs> Well. <laughs> Don't look at my driver's license information either. Uh, that, I, I don't trust the way. It, it's basically making um, getting access without authorization okay. for the purpose of. You know, and, and I just wanted, I know you had pulled it because at least the one that you were working on, because you wanted to update it to be more in line. This is just coming in line with the Washington state law so that we can prosecute within our city because it is a gross demeanor, which is under our state. Okay. Um, is there any benefit to keeping it in our municipal courts as opposed to we couldn't wouldn't it be under a KC jurisdiction if we didn't have or so we already have a law in place for updating it. Can you just clarify those right so right now we have cyber stalking but it references the wrong RCW it's Got it. that they've changed the the numbering and so it, it references the wrong one. Um, so we we couldn't prosecute this locally because our code it's wrong, and so if we try, someone will point that out. And they'll get the case dismissed. Um, and so, the 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 reason that we we do that is that so we have a prosecutor's office and um, we have a municipal court, and so we want to have the ability to put those cases into our system instead of pushing them over the county. If um, I mean, like there have been circumstances where like cities have completely repealed their municipal hearings against criminal code as a way to divert cases to the county instead of their own court. Hmm. So um, those are like things that are that get into a lot of issue where like but for one or two cases here and there, they
they don't mind when we send them over. If it was something where we were doing it like more deliberately, then they would, there was, there's a provision in the RCW that we could actually be forced into arbitration to start paying. Okay. Thank um, you very much for explaining all that. That's all. Excellent. All right. Consent? Consent it is. All right. Thank you so much, Attorney General. Uh, getting close to an hour and a half, and we're about the end of the section A, so folks feel good with reconvening at 6.35. All right, I'm going to break, 6.35. Recording stopped.
No, that's a, that's amazing. Like I feel like wow. All right, six thirty-five. Recording in progress. All right, I'll go back to the meeting here. Now in general counsel business, and up first is B1, Audit Committee Chairman Makler to provide a summary of highlights of the recent Audit Committee meetings. Okay, meetings on February 27th and March 6th. Oh, sorry, in microphone. Mike. Yeah. Ah, okay. Um, so during the audit committee, we received the draft budget memo, um, which we had selected as the place where we wanted to, the first thing we wanted to start working on. The whole parking thing has been pushed forward due to negotiations till at least this fall. So we needed a, a topic to begin work on. Um, and Quinn is right here to check me if I go wrong. So we reviewed that, but there had been a glitch and it had been received less than 24 hours before the meeting. So we tentatively approved the budget committee draft memo, um, but we then had a special meeting this past Monday in which we unanimously approved the budget draft memo. Um, it, hang about, please. Oh, it made several suggestions that I had understood um, from council. Sorry, the memo I sent you did not open. Um, that I had understood after the budget workshops last year had proceeded from council. Um, if Eric uh, suggested that we involve the public more fully, make certain that public engagement could happen. Part of that was just technical and we didn't bring it up because the microphones weren't fully functioning, but also there wasn't really that much time. Um, I proposed, and these are things that I thought were the general consensus of council, and so I'm bringing them back to you. <laughs> They're in the memo, and I'm, but I'm bringing them back to you at this time. Um, beginning, beginning work, lengthening the time between when the budget drops and when the budget final Q&A comes so that we're not dealing with a fire hose of information. Even though we're better at it this year than we were last, or I at least, um, it's it's still, it's a lot of information and it's difficult for us, I, I believe, to make a thoughtful review. So one possibility is to break out, you know how at the beginning of the budget presentations, people would come and say, this is my department, this is our department, this is what we do. These are the projects we're currently working on. This is what we want to work on next year. Well, that's all informational and doesn't necessarily require finance. So those um, uh, I proposed could be um, pushed back, you know, into September or even August. And once you actually get the memo in a form that you can read, I'm so sorry, um, you'll see that uh, Jenny's been the auditor pulled together a lot of comparisons to local jurisdictions and to the great and good uh, Roseville, Minnesota, um, which has a particularly excellent, excellent budget presentation. Um, Bainbridge Island has a fantastic budget. Here's the thing, Bainbridge Island has 10 people who do nothing all year, but work on the budget and work on presenting it. Um, so I made those two suggestions, feeling that they would be in line with what council was looking for um, as a way to make the budget, to give us a chance to do more thoughtful review. And in fact, one new member of the committee hadn't, they had been, they said the community was very upset at how council dealt with the budget. They had not been aware that we saw it when the public saw it. So um, I think that this would be directly helpful to the community. So I will send this to you again. Um, I, I just discovered that the link was broken. It's uh, several pages and I think you'll agree that Jenny did a really excellent job of, of finding similarities and doing comparisons. Um, and that's 
about it, except that since it's now almost mid-March, if we're going to adopt some of these suggestions, I strongly urge that we take it up at either the next meeting. So actually, I had a, a general uh, business item, which ties right into this, which was I talked to Director Riley about options. Um, and you briefed me what's been done in the past. And if I got it right, Director Riley, one option is um, Monday at the start of budget week, we could dive into the general, have our regular Wednesday council meeting, Thursday, get the brain download from Public Works, and then have all week and the following Thursday do our deliberation to add an extra week in there was an option that if, if make sure I got that right. And then I was going to ask council if they were good with that. So it's they need to schedule out the, the year. Yeah, that is correct. There's a, there's a little nuance in the following week. Um, on Wednesday of that week, we actually take action on rates and fees and property tax. So you would actually be voting on an item prior to deliberating on the complete budget. So we could make an adjustment to move the Thursday proposed deliberations to a Tuesday or to a Monday. That way you're not voting on something prior. We've done that in the past. We've actually voted before and made some fees and then we went to deliberations on Thursday. It just makes it a little bit kind of awkward when you're when you're voting on revenue sources um, and then deliberating on the complete budget. So, uh, I, but either way is fine. But it would be in the following week. I'll get back to you on if that was in line with the uh, auto recommendation. Um, okay. Can you guys, can we um, put a pin in this while I go and dig up the correct link so that I can actually send it to, do you have it, Christine, to be able to send it to council? Well, uh, yeah, I think Christine said it will be available shortly. It'll be available like shortly within a minute? I don't know. No. No, I just want to make sure that everybody has it now. Um, and for me, yeah, yeah, so we'll get the we'll get the memo soon. But um, I think I was looking for you know, feedback on doing that different scheduling to allow more time if folks liked it or not. Just because I think we do want to move on setting that schedule now this far in advance. Yeah, Michael. Right. Yeah, the perfect. It's, it's, sorry, I, really, I just realized microphone. So, um, Michael made the point that we, when the administration finishes, it goes out to everybody at once. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, the proposal is to do it so that we just have an extra week of after we get the brain download, after we see the budget, council has a week to talk to the public, get feedback. Um, and deliberate and, and you know and, and think about it more ourselves before we go straight into the deliberation. Uh, Jennifer, I'm back on it. I feel like I'm maybe I'm even stealing Council Andrews' thunder, but we don't always have to wait for a budget. We can propose a budget as council too. So that's something for y'all to consider as we're thinking about budget season. Well, yeah, I just want to keep this really scoped on the that week there, or that week or two, certainly we can talk budget and requests way in advance, but this is specifically for setting up that week for, for staff. Well, I'm not hearing any objections. Yeah, whatever yeah. gives more transparency and more opportunity for the public uh, to weigh in as well, I'm I'm all for. And it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't really change anything. It, it just extends, it still fits within any requirements we have. And right, yeah, we can't, yeah. we can't spend two months on it, um, yeah. but yeah, this would allow extra time. I'm sorry, I thought Eric went back to on it. Uh, perhaps a, it's a marginal improvement. I wouldn't, I would suggest you don't make a decision tonight. I would suggest you run this by Lori Smith. There's the budget dates are set the way they are for a reason. And, uh, I know Mike's got good insight on this. The, the, the main the main point of this, in my opinion, is building on what Jennifer said. We heard last fall from the public expressing frustration that basically this was a done deal. I felt this way for years as a council member that we get this big budget, however, hundreds of millions of dollars, and it just never, I just shake my head every year going, we're arguing over 
and it's you know, I think last year I was literally banging my head on the table for somebody. But the, the, the point is the council's wishes should be expressed to the administration and the public. Uh, they don't have as much opportunity as we do. We don't express what we want in the next budget, shame on us. But the council doesn't have that, or the, the public doesn't have that ability. So we should be requesting well beforehand public's input. Here's our current budget. Do you have any suggestions? If we're sincere about public outreach, we need to be proactive. I don't care about moving up two days a week or whatever for the whole budget process. But if we really want public opinion, if that's what we're saying, well, gosh darn it, let's do it. And then council should be talking to the council president. We should have study sessions saying, this is what I'd like to see in next year's budget. Give it to the administration, have them work with it. And then they can tell us why they didn't incorporate in the budget instead of giving us a budget saying, here it is. And then we fight over $25,000. That's the point. So here's my suggestion is to go through finance committee for start talking about some of that extra public outreach, how to maybe coordinate some of that, see what the bandwidth is. Um, Cause as I said, we don't have a ton of staff in the city, but I, I absolutely like that. And then, um, I guess the decision I'm looking for doesn't affect any of that. We can be count talking with the council. Right now I've got the, the fifth Wednesday in May, I've got set aside if we want to use it to, to talk budget in advance, um, which I think is a great idea. Um, but I don't see if there's any objections to shifting this back to give a, at least an extra week for for nothing else, us as a council to absorb all the information in the proposed budget um, in case big changes. I don't, I don't have an objection to that. I just think uh, this decision should be held off um, until everybody has a chance to sure. digest Jenny's memo because it, it did include some really great um, okay. recommendations, including. Uh, adding visuals, there, there, were, there were things other than just timing. So I'd like everybody to, to see that work product before we make a decision. Director Riley, is that already week, week, two weeks? Is that gonna affect the? No, not not on the calendar. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that as Councilman Younger just pointed out, the, the process of the dates of the budget, when the budget gets released, when we have to adopt, there's not a lot of wiggle room. It's, it's set, you have to adopt before December 1st. Um, but we, the, the, the proposal that uh, Council President uh, proposed is what we did three years ago. Uh, we went to one week session the year after that, got great feedback, said the information was ready, available, and in their head. So by the time we delivered it, they knew what we talked about. We followed that up, got great feedback, and now we're kind of back saving one more time. So we're flexible within those two weeks. Uh, I've read the memo from the auditor's office, or the auditor, which I think is very useful. It's got a lot of key information. I will say some of the comparable comparables have large budget teams. So recognize that we have a team of one and, and then myself um obviously the city as a whole does a lot of work to put that together the timelines are tight it's a lot of information so um and also one of the things they highlight in there is we're talking about outreach it's council member budget like uh town hall outreach it's not the staff going out it's getting if you want something early again I, I would recommend you make a decision early that you're doing town halls and asking what the public wants and then we can hear that because it's the mayor's budget that we're proposing and then it turns into the council budget. Um, I will say the mayor's budget is based on, based on our, our uh, priorities and goals that are set at our retreat and also the kind of the mayor's initiative stuff so here. That's how we derive the budget. And I don't think last year's was too deviated from what I think we heard from council. Um, so that's kind of the information we take as we compile it. Um, but it'd be much, yeah, the information early because we're starting personnel budgeting starting in two weeks and we're in the budget mode. So. Sooner the better, but uh, two weeks isn't going to hurt anything. So, thank you. Okay, perfect. So let's postpone that decision on on what to do with the budget week to two weeks, and keep talking through finance and the next council meetings about how to do outreach more early and often. Does that sound like a plan? Okay, perfect. All right, back to you. Close the auditor, and then uh, we can move in here. Okay. So I I have the memo, but it is in Korean. <laughs> All right. Not. No worries. Okay, so that'll get distributed. And anything yeah, else on a committee on it? Or, uh... Go figure. Um, I think that um, there's a lot in the memo that very clearly defines what the the end date, like when we have to be done with the budget. Really, I think we we have a this subject. Yeah, so, but, but there's anything else non-budget from audit? Yeah, yeah. but that's it. So please read the memo and what kind of. Uh, just asking, are, are we going to put this on like a regular agenda item? 
let's revisit this in two weeks back on our general council business and we'll give direction Thank on the, on the uh, timeline. For Eric, yeah. Just real quickly, I'd like some feedback on what a two year budget would look like if the city would consider that. It, um, pros and cons. Fair enough. And, uh, okay, let's talk about that in two weeks as well. Okay. All right, let's go now to finance chair Jennifer Chamberlain. The meeting Thank goes you. on February 28th. February, I have for February 28th. No, 28th, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, that's a zero. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, well, we had one of the issues was already on our, uh, we have it on the consent agenda for the materials, but we had a really great um, update on the Cartograph Asset Management System by our fantastic asset manager, Terrell Brown. Um, and we learned a little bit about what they're doing with uh, that asset management system now. Uh, right now, they um, that system uh, measures and manages water resources, utilities, wastewater. Um, uh, some of the assets of the city include streets, water, power lines, et cetera, things like that. There is um, a time frame to integrate more systems uh, for all the public works and the parks department. It's six to seven years to integrate that. Um, and so I think, um, and we got a, we did get a, an update on our investment uh, spreadsheet, our portfolio, but I think some of the really interesting discussion was in our other business. We talked about um, does the condo model make sense for the non fixed building anymore? Um, had a couple of perspectives on that. Um, <clears throat> basically, if you don't know what the condo model is for, uh, for the Norm Dix building, um, government agencies are renting different floors. It's uh, under contract that, um, that you have to be, you know, government entity to rent one floors here. Um, and so we had an interesting discussion on that. We had a parking update. Um, it looks like there's going to be in the future uh, some, uh, there's a uh, new signage at the conference center, but they're going to have future opportunities. You can actually go online and see if there's parking available for these places. And uh, we talked about, uh, we've talked a little bit about the port parking too, which isn't in our jurisdiction necessarily, but um, looks like some of that parking was diverted to the new Marina Square. So all good stuff with parking. Um, I think that's it for me. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. I'll go to uh, Public Safety Committee Chair Denise Fry. Yes, thank you. Uh, we were joined by both both chiefs, both uh, Chief McGanny and Chief Wolf. And as you can imagine, the discussion continued uh, in support of the of the levy. Uh, we heard from Chief well, uh, Wolf. Another, it was great to have him in. Uh, uh, but uh, another verbal uh, uh, took it took us through it verbally. Um, I think that uh, Councilperson Chamberlain enjoyed not being chair, so she could, you know, ask some some good questions. Uh, and the chief was great. He actually said during the meeting uh, that he welcomed <clears throat> that he really welcomed uh, Lee, what he called leaning in. Uh, so there was some really good dialogue. Uh, I thought um, uh, adding Chief Wolf's perspective to Chief McGanning's. Um, uh, at the end of that, I, I we got the impression that they are now working with you. Is that right, Attorney Fennell? Uh, I kept asking presentation, presentation, presentation. We need one paper. We need, you know, whatever it distilled. And so um, this actually brings up, I wanted to, this isn't only particularly to public safety, but I did want it to get it out here that, you know, I, I'm seeing pretty consistently that we need presentation skills um, and and the ability to take a whole lot of information and distill it and spit it out to the right audience so that it'll resonate, people will understand it. I don't know whether our city attorney is the appropriate person to do that. I really respect you, Kylie, but I um, don't keep, know. Keep your domain here a little bit. But, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, and so for me, it goes right into what council recommended in its retreat, and that was we've got to have some kind of communications position that can kind of set some parameters uh, around this so that, it, you know, before we get to that let, ordinance. Let me clear. I'm going to keep it back to me in the public safety briefing, but. Um, yeah, well, that's it. 
Yeah, yeah. It, we spend a long time listening uh, to a lot of information. Um, and so uh, I look forward, I think we all do, uh, to getting uh, that in a, in a more understandable um, method. Uh, and then we also uh, brought up uh, the, the toilet uh, because we had referred that into public safety, thinking that it was a public safety uh, project. Uh, we were told it is not a public safety. While it might have, while it might have public safety implications, uh, uh, public safety is you know not in charge of putting in the toilet. And so I have communicated with President Coughlin that the committee would uh, like some some direction on that you know, or council needs direction on that, what department is in charge of this from the administration. Director Riley, did we, I know I talked to you the other day about where that $10,000 ended up. Yeah, yeah, the, the funding source is actually in the city council's budget where it landed, but again, okay. who's gonna implement, it's still general fund money, but it's in the council budget. Okay, so it wasn't there. Okay, good not know. On that item, if you're looking for direction from well, so, so public safety doesn't have a recommendation on what to do with public work or something like given, but. Is it sorry. okay if I ask, well, no, public safety does not have a recommendation. Okay. If it's not gone through, we were gonna discuss it and there was a lot of pushback. Uh, it's it's not really, it, where does it, where's its home? Uh, it's not, if it's council budget, uh, does that mean we do the work to make it happen. Um, what I don't understand, it's council's budget. Does that, what does that mean in answer to it? our budget? Can I do some clar clarifying uh, on this issue? So we've been told in, yeah, in the past that it was gonna be in a different, um, that it wasn't gonna be in the public safety arena and also our uh, chiefs don't wanna manage it, right? Right. The direction from council, right? We said we're gonna refer it to public safety, but we don't have, but then, um, uh, Mayor Wheeler, do you have any idea where, uh, which department you're going to assign this project to? Yeah, and understanding that we don't, you do want us to come to meet with stakeholders to discuss this issue, like Marvin Williams, et cetera. Yeah, the program's set up, the whole, it's ready to go, um, meeting with, as we do with programs, meeting with the neighbors, down there, they'd like to um, meet with council uh, leadership um, to learn more about um, this program. Sounds good. So are you gonna bring something to present to council on how to implement this or if it is in council budget, I believe we need to we'll give approval on the time spending the funds. I'll leave it up to you to reach out. If you wanna reach out to the leadership, I can set you up. Uh, a meeting, I can... I'm sorry, May, I heard you have a, a proposal on how to implement a... Yeah, the, yeah. the proposals um, includes outreach. And so we, we met, uh, there was a lot of pushback from the neighborhood uh, about location and about unintended consequences. So um, since it's not my program to administer, I felt it was important for you to hear it because this is your program. So, well, so the outreach was... Mm -hmm. The outreach was conducted by the mayor's office, um, but it's a council project. Yeah, we definitely have some. some yeah. Power. So, Mayor, I just want to be clear: Do you have a, a proposed location and way to spend the money? Am I hearing that correctly, or is that there, not the case? There's an idea. You know, I think at this point, it's it's going to be better to hear from the public. Um, so I don't have a proposal. Okay, yet. so you don't have a proposal to spend the where to where to locate it, where to locate it. I, I think the public uh, needs to weigh in, like we do with all of our processes that we we bring forward. We have a public, we give the public an opportunity to weigh in. No, yeah, please. I would like okay, suggestions on a path forward for this fair, because fair. it's kind of an impasse. To be fair, Mayor, um, when we do receive public comment, that's after we have a proposal. And so I guess yeah. specifically, which department will handle this? Will it be public works or will it be public safety? Pub public safety. Public safety. Or public, actually it's gonna be public works. 
Public Works will manage this project. Oh, you know, as far as the, um, you know, changing out the whatever toilet paper and stuff like that, yeah, that'll be Public Works. Okay. So it is in council budget, but the department that's going to be in charge of this is Public Works. So, so this needs to go through. So the, we did not discuss this specifically because we didn't want to breach quorum. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we are sending this issue to Public Works and it should be on your agenda. All right. I think just okay. that, to me, sorry, for, for procedure, yeah. So the suggestion is to send it to Public Works and yeah, which I, which I agree with then it's that's the proper department. Yep. And that's my report. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Yes, Michael Diva. Put on that. Yeah, I just want to. It seems like we're all sort of surprised how this is coming together. And this is exactly how I remember the discussion coming out of budget that the council decided that public safety, even if it's only the three council members on public safety, we're going to come up with a plan to move this forward. So I don't know who on public safety. Well, yeah, no, that, that's it. Is. And I remember the administration idea. all kind of doing, uh, you know, not it because it doesn't. It's not a good fit. We don't we don't do a lot of social service programs. Mm -hmm. So now, if we want to kick it to public works, we can. I mean, but who's deciding that? Again, I feel like now public safety just did a not it. Yeah, and I agree. Then, I agree. Then, it's getting bunted around. You know, yes. So I like that suggestion of study section and what study is. Yeah. That was attorney Fennell's suggestion. Bring it to the larger group. So I think then that's what we need to do is kick yeah. it around through study session again. And it's not that we don't want to play not it. It's that our people who our staff people that were there were saying, we're not, we don't want to do this. Right. And so, thank you very much for your pushback on that. No, I understand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah you know, separation of powers. And, and once we fund something, which is the legislative power, does that get kicked into the administration? And, you know, we don't really have a control or priority or when it gets done or anything like that. And I was thinking the exact same thing that Michael brought up. Like this was something that some folks on council were very, very passionate about. And it seemed like a pet project and they were going to run with it. And now it seems like it's being punted. So what I think needs to happen is um, a little bit of clarification, maybe from the city attorney of whether or not, like just because we fund something, is it going to happen and how much control does council have? Uh, abstracting it, there's other things, right? We funded the DEI position. There's discussion about how much council is involved in that role um, versus the administration. And I just wanna make sure that those abstract rules are being applied consistently through whatever council is funding. I, I don't want to, you know, create a separation of powers issue and, and get into the mayor's business. Um, but I also want to make sure that that when we are funding something and taking something on, we understand what that actually means. Um, so it seems like there needs to be a little bit of clarification around some things. Thank you. Well said. So let's put that um, all over the town for attorney Fennell and work on that for uh, Fennell for, Fennel for the next Next study session. That sounds good. All right. Thank you. It'll be very helpful considering we have a large number of items, not just this one, but it's just good to be clear. All right. Moving along. Uh, other regional and other committees slash boards, quick briefings on anything that affects council, the RCC, go ahead. Yep. Pick up transit, et cetera. So go ahead. Does anybody have anything that they want to have come before Kitsap Transit? Okay, so just um, there's a ridership report which I'll be sending out to all of you. Um, the obvious, you know, in case it's not a, it's not a surprise, Bremerton has on beyond the lion's share of the ridership. Um, the rest of almost the rest 
all the rest of the meeting was about where they, they finally landed on a site for uh, the Seattle side that would be used just for Kitsap Transit. It's Pier 48 right near the stadium. So I asked just to be really certain that um, when a woman alone on a dark night goes out and it's not a game night, that there's really strong protections so that that woman is, is you know, who might not be surrounded by a, a crowd of people. Um, it has safe, it, you know, it was safe on her way to, or anyone vulnerable, really. So I just chose a woman because it's International Women's Day. Um, so any other, they have a place, they're doing the, they, it's, it's narrowed down to, to Pier 48. Uh, the, the rest of it is they're going to condemn something in Fort Orchard, nothing to do with us. Um, that was it, pretty much from Kitsap Transit. Excellent. Anyone else? Eric? Does Pier 48 already have a dock or is this something that's five years from now? Pier 48 does have a dock. It seems to be in decent shape. They're using it for staging. Um, it's direct. It, it's directly opposite the stadium, maybe very slightly to the north of the stadium. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a real place. No, oh, that's good news. My office is right near there, so I can start taking the passenger very <laughs> Well, all right. But yeah, that it's they're just starting the scoping, so it's down the line. Perfect. I'll brief out that uh, kids have done one met the other day, all routine on um, let's say funding, some really good statistics from the number of calls they get. I can try to find portal on that information. And then similarly, I've been attending all the Puget Sound Regional Council um, meetings and a couple slides I'll try and forward. I have really good discussions on housing across the Puget Sound, some good statistics put out there, and a lot of discussion on. Some of the infrastructure money flowing down from the federal government through, through PSRC, which the city can then apply for. Um, but nothing, uh, nothing I'd say groundbreaking, but great regular work. And, all right, any other regional briefings? It's not a regional briefing, and we will have one other. I will have our city then, council meeting before that. But I just wanted to uh, talk about just briefly that um, there's going to be a um, Meeting to discuss temporary board membership for the Bremerton Farmers Market. Oh, fair meeting. enough, but that's not a regional or other committee meeting that we've attended. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm sticking on, on Thursday. Sticking on agenda here. March 16th in that real estate. All right, next up, item B5 is Councilmember Anna Mockler has two minutes to present a proposal to pursue new language for Chapter 20.14 in Title Critical Areas and Chapter 20.15 Title Landscaping of a BMC. So per our discussion on rules and procedures, not in rule four, Anna has two minutes to present and we'll give a thumbs up or thumbs down to see if we have a majority if we want to even hear more about it. Sorry to be blunt, but that was our, our discussion. So Anna, please uh, take it away. Did all of you have a chance to read even the first few pages of this? Okay. So one thing that I omitted that I should have included is the push for native vegetation is because these are plants that grew up here. They evolved with this soil, they evolved with this climate, they evolved with the pollinators, the predators, they, um, the soil. It's, that's the reason. And a nice side benefit of that is that after a couple of years of watering, they're established and don't require a permanent irrigation system. Um, the many ways that they interact with wildlife, I only have two minutes, I'm not going into. Um, with critical areas, uh, let me just, because I have two minutes, um, I, there's a large wetland, for example, below Pendergast Park. It's a series of beaver dams with otter pups, herons, raptors, eagles, osprey. It's not coming to us to say, I need a, a second contract amendment. It's a self-sustaining system that is purifying our water. Um, I can't speak to the other critical areas and I'm not trying to put the, you know, that's outside my scope. The, um, these, these ordinances need updating. I'd like to update them um, as I've shown in the scope of work by comparing them to a number of nearby municipalities and um, bring the results to you for you to approve or deny. And that's it. I'm just going to look to council and see if we have four more thumbs up to uh, discussing this in the future. 
All right, not seeing them. Let's see, two thumbs up, three. Well, it would be to, if we could either discuss it now if we want to, but an action item or, yeah, I'll say, okay, thumbs up to just discuss it briefly now um, if there's any interest. Or, to, or discuss another date. Yeah, we can do that too. Okay. All right, we'll move it to another uh, agenda. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Next up, last, nope, second last item is uh, B6. Um, so this will be information only, which it's going forward if it says information only on the agenda. I'm going to take that as strictly information only, means no questions, no comments. It's just somebody briefing out information to us. Um, so I'll make that clear for any, any future item from anybody. Looking at you, Denise. Um, yeah. So in this case, oh yes, yeah, so I just read the title. Clint Dennehy um, and Attorney Fennell are here to present information only briefing on proposed ordinance to create a permanent race equity slash DEI commission. Um, I have some PowerPoint slides. I don't know if you can bring up the first one. Um, so the, the, the goal is to create a citizen-led institutionalized mechanism for analyzing city systems, policies, budgets, agendas, goals, practices, and actions through a race equity lens with the goal of eliminating systemic racism in the city of Bremerton. So procedural posture, just to get everybody up to speed, um, the REAC or Race Equity Advisory Committee was formed by motion in 2020 in response to racial unrest in the United States um, and, and a desire to do something at the local level. Uh, this was done by motion, which didn't conform with the charter, which requires committees um, and commissions to be uh, appointed by the mayor, confirmed by the city council. So this ordinance is a fix on that to create a permanent commission um, where those folks would have input into both branches of government, both the executive and the legislative, where the ad hoc committee that um, basically dissolved at the end of last year um, was only advising city council. That, um, if you move on to the next slide, um, you know, one of the big things that I do when I present is try to get at the why. Um, you know, 34% of Bremerton residents identify as BIPOC. If you don't know what BIPOC is, it's Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, according to the 2020 U.S. Census, 34% of Bremerton residents identify as BIPOC. Um, when we look at things at a local level, a lot of things that we're looking at right now in the council priorities are about affordable housing, um, the ability to access um, resources, which, which goes towards median income as well as wealth. And take a look at those statistics. I don't think anybody's going to be surprised by the wealth gap that is does not track statistically, right? Like if you had 30% of the population being BIPOC in a fair society, 30% of those residents, you know, the entire population, um, sorry, would be low income or homeless. And there's definitely gaps there. If you move on to the next one, um, there has been a little focus on, well, why are we just focusing on race instead of all areas of oppression? Well, if you look at social science research, um, women, when you look at groups of women and life outcomes and um, issues of, of, of social disparity, BIPOC women fare the worst. BIPOC LGBTQ members fare the worst. BIPOC people with disabilities, BIPOC religious minorities, BIPOC immigrants. So if you really want to focus on a problem, race is the problem in the United States because of our social constructs um, that we've dealt with through history. Go on to the next slide. Um, a lot of people have kind of looked at this. There's a difference between equality and equity. Equality is everybody gets the same things. Equity is looking at what people need in order to access the same opportunities. So if you look at the ball game, that's the access to opportunity. Think about housing, think about long life expectancy, think about healthcare. The fence are institutional barriers and um, the different size humans represent different uh, oppressed groups or non-oppressed groups and, and what people actually need in order to assess that. If you move on to the next side, I really like this. This is reality. If you look at the history of racism in the United States, uh, the person on 
uh, you know, six boxes plus being tall are, are us, it's, it's white folks. Um, and then you go to the right, the, the hole that has been dug by institutions, by laws, by um, structural barriers is where people of color start off. Um, and then you can look at what equality, equity, and then liberation, which is really what I get excited about is removing barriers for all anyway. Um, but really what we want to try to go is going from reality to equity uh, before we get to that liberation stage. So the way we do that at the local level, and a lot of local jurisdictions have done, um, I think we can go on to the next one, um, is through the ordinance. Um, so as you look through the ordinance, what I did is I provided two ordinances. I provided the comments from the ordinance that I'm sorry, so Brett and Kylie drafted an ordinance on my request based on Bainbridge Island early in 2022, I believe. Um, we took that to the committee just as kind of like a rough structure of like, here's how Bainbridge Island does it. We took it and over the entire year, I think we had at least three or four full meetings dedicated for the Race Equity Advisory Committee to go through and change it, make comments, go through the meat grinder, and what I promised them is that I would present that recommendation from the committee to you all. Uh, I do have that document, but I also have a document that I edited based on legal advice. Um, there were some separation of power issues, some conforming with the charter issues. So there's a second reiteration. Um, that one also has a couple of legal comments. I'm gonna clean that up before the next session. So just go ahead and look at both the proposal from last year's REAC and the one that went through legal and myself. And these are some guiding questions that I'd like you to think about when we actually do discuss it. Um, what would council like REACT to look like? What type of funding does council hope to provide REACT? How will council ensure REACT works with the DEI manager? How does council wish to communicate with REACT? And how do we ensure our own white privilege does not interfere with our decisions regarding REACT? Like really come from a place of, you know, just because we haven't had the same uh, life experience and blocked opportunities that people of color have had, that should not be framing our, our decision making. We should be framing it from recommendations from the community, specifically community of color. And that's, that's where this REACT committee kind of has funneled through. Uh, with that, I'll just turn it over to uh, Attorney Pinnell, who's done a ton, ton, ton of work, especially with me. The, the last year um, and and really um, it, it's working hard to make sure that whatever our product is conforms and, and works really well. So thank you for that. Thanks, Ben. So um, I'm gonna talk about the, the ordinance that is um, that Quinn shared that has, it's like Denahy with legal advice, I think is the title. So when you're looking through your, your materials after you leave here, that's the one um, that I want you to relate these comments to. Um, and it's just really the big question. So the, just keep in mind that the DEI person um, that will be on staff, that was, um, DEI is different than REACT um, in that it, it's a wider group. You think about like how we had the discussion about goals in 2022, about are they gonna be racist, race center, or are they gonna be wider? So that's a big question for council to consider is this group gonna be um, race center, or is it going to be um, all um, groups that have um, encountered oppression? So I would say just keep that in mind. Um, the next thing is just to consider, um, and this is a, a risk management issue, whether or not the commission will be able to accept public comment at their meetings. And this is a big one to keep in mind. If for all of you have had to moderate meetings, um, when um, our charter requires that all committee meetings be open to the public. That's our charter requirement. OPMA actually doesn't apply to advisory committees, um, but what happens is when that advisory committee accepts public comment, then it comes under OPMA and then subjects um, the members that are conducting the meeting um, to the OPMA requirements. It also means that whoever's moderating the meeting has to moderate in conformance with um, the law and the constitutional requirements um, of the First Amendment, um, which can also um, be a, a, an area in which the city is exposed to risk. So those, that's another thing is whether or not the 
the committee meetings are going to be advisory so that the folks um, at the meeting can talk amongst themselves. They can even talk outside of, um, you know, in, in smaller groups. It, it, it's a little tricky because our charter actually has that requirement, but the OPMA does it. If, if, if they happen to break quorum, it's not a legal issue where everyone's going to get fined um, $500. It would be, you know, that shouldn't happen because it's not in compliance with the charter. So that's the other one. Um, also, it's just um, look at the um, removal. We've had a removal come up uh, recently in, in, in a different commission. Um, and it's not unlike some of the other ones, I'll say that, but it's just something to think about. Um, and so if someone on the committee was, um, let's say what we were just talking about, like taking an action that was subjecting the city to liability, do you want, um, it might be awkward for the other committee members to be put in a position to have to make the call to remove them instead of, um, basically being able to be taken off the same way they came on by the council. Um, and so keep that in mind. Um, and other than that, the meetings and well, powers and duties is a big section that came um, in large part from Bainbridge Island. Um, it's pretty specific. And, um, you know, this is supposed to, uh, it's just going to be codified in our code. And so um, being broad might give them more flexibility. In particular, there's some discussion about a racial equity action plan and implementation strategy. We don't have a racial equity action plan right now. Um, might be a, you know, a goal for council in 2024 because we have these 2023 goals related to this. Maybe that's the next step, but that's what's in here and that's, there's nothing in here that the Bainbridge Island had. Um, so those are things to keep in mind and happy to keep working on this. Last comment, sorry. Um, I also included two documents from King County. Um, I, I interviewed there and was offered a position that I ultimately turned down, but I was really, really, really fascinated and really impressed with these two documents. Um, one is basically an assessment of all of the outcomes that happen in King County based on race. So basically identifying the problem uh, that we all deal with, homelessness, housing instability, um, access to parks, uh, things, you know, all, all of these things that are near and dear to our house, to our, to our hearts, and how that plays out racially. And then the second document is their strategic plan from 2016 to 2022 on how they plan to address that. So there, I know that there's a lot of questions about, you know, why do we need this in, in local government? Um, go ahead and take these two weeks to mull through those documents, and I think a lot of your questions will be answered. Thanks a lot. Excellent. Thanks so much to both of you. And yes, so in two weeks, we'll actually talk and discuss this and dig into the meat of how to uh, best accomplish this council goal and priority and get this crafted. Excellent. All right. And now finally, we're at other general council business. So sorry to cut you off to be proper earlier, but this would be a good point if you want to bring up that meeting. Well, I apologize for being a little sassy, <laughs> President Coughlin. Um, and so, <laughs> well, it was not that, come on, y'all have seen me sassy. Or I want to just, uh, just what I was saying is that we all know that there's been some issues. Well, I don't know if we all know, but now we do. There's been some issues with uh, the farmer's market. There's been a lot of um, uh, stitching up that, that it turns out needs to happen for it to, to occur this year. So in an effort to try to get it rolling um, for this year, uh, there's going to be a meeting at the Minette Real Estate Company on Thursday, March 16th at 530 for uh, all those who are interested in being prospective board members temporarily um, uh, or even volunteering, but they need a lot of help. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you, President Collins. Well, thank you. Briefly. It's just temporary board members. Yeah. You just like be a board member for this one time. It would not. Yeah. Perfect. And I've got two items. It's just a reminder. St. Patrick's Day Parade this Saturday um, starts at 11. I'm waiting to get information exactly where, where it will line up, but um, council will have its own section to march in. So and bring, I forgot to mention, bring significant others, friends, family, if you want to march with us. So um, more than welcome. And uh, remember to order your unique embroidery, unique embroidery items, hopefully by this Wednesday. I'm guilty of procrastinating as well. Um, but again, it's not a hard, hard deadline, but I want, I want them to know that the orders are coming. So just as two reminders. Um, and with that, we'll now convene for an executive session for 20 minutes. Oh, I'm so sorry. My bad. So yeah, you had another general business item. My bad. Thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> it's the thing that came from the side. Um, so I was following up on the communication director. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Rick Brazidas, but his daughter Tori has moved back to Bremerton from Hansville. Um, she is a communications person. And we had, um, we spoke for about an hour or so and distilled what would be the duties of different levels of the communication director. Um, I'd like to bring this up in the future for right now. I'm just going to say high points. Our salary would be 60 to 90 K. Um, and there are three elements of what's important about it. So can I propose this is, this is on our council goal and priority. So we'll make sure that we get to talking about it this year. Um, so I'm um, asking if there's interest in hearing about this at a future time, if not now. No, I think it's on our goals and priorities, so we will be talking about it this year. We will be getting okay. that item done. So, All right, I'd like yeah. to hit these three points, if that's okay. Okay, really quick. Sort of, yeah. um, what is the position called? Where does it nest? That is, who does it report to? Um, and how is it involved in decisions? Um, there's also a list of skills, which I'll shoot you at a future time. Perfect. I have a second good of the order thing. All right. Snacks. <laughs> when you invite uh, people to your home for uh, dinner time, uh, but, you have Anna, to give them talk, a snack. Talk to me individually on this. Talk to me individually on this one if you're requesting um, items for council. Okay, folks, I need to say this for the for the record. All right, but hold on, hold on. Section C, executive session. Council will now convene for an executive session for 20 minutes to discuss potential litigation per RCW 42.30.110, section one, subsection I. No action is anticipated. We'll reconvene in 20 minutes. Recording stopped.
Recording in progress. Recording stopped.